evening and welcome to today's BIC streams. The camera has witnessed the truth of our times. Joining us today are our panelists Prashant Panjiar, Fazwan Hussain, and Akar Patel. This session is in collaboration with the Museum of Art and Photography. For those of you who are not on the Bangalore International Centers or the Museum of Art and Photography's mailing list, do sign up. Uh, by visiting our respective websites. Uh, with that, welcome everyone and over to you, Priscilla. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Priscilla from the Museum of Art and Photography. Uh, for those of you who do not know, the Museum of Art and Photography is a new and uh, uh, upcoming museum in the center of Bangalore City. And while our building is under construction, and even more so uh, during uh, this lockdown, we have taken a number of our initiatives and our activities online. One of them, one of them being uh, this Art and Culture Lecture Series, which we have been doing in collaboration with the BIC um, since last year. And it's been great to be able to continue this in this format. Um, Map is, uh, MAP's mission is to take art and bring it back into the heart of the community. And we want to make art as accessible to the most diverse of audiences as possible. And this lecture series is one of the ways we do that. So without taking any more of uh, the time for this evening, I'd like to hand it off now to Akar Patel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Priscilla. Thank you to both of our guests, uh, Prashant and to Fozan. Thank you to the BIC for doing this. Thank you most of all to all of you who are logged in. Uh, I hope that you continue doing so. I don't think we should stop our um, activities, uh, whether they are uh, cultural or social. Because of the uh, pandemic, we all need to be very careful, of course. That doesn't mean that we need to uh, bring our lives to a halt. We've got two men that I have known by reputation and work for a very long time. Um, one of them at least for 30 years. The other one of them worked at a newspaper that I used to work with uh, more than 20 years ago. They represent a field of journalism that I think uh, is probably what uh, is the epoch, the best part of uh, print journalism, which is that it shows through still photography reality in a way that print uh, certainly cannot. And I think I should be uh, qualified to say this having been a, a print reporter myself. I'd like to start by asking uh, Prashant, the subjects that we have today uh, include the role of uh, photojournalism and the nature of documentary uh, photography then and now. I'd like to start by asking uh, Prashant Panjiar to just describe a little bit about himself and his background uh, and uh, talk about what it is that brought him into this field. Yeah, uh, so as we had discussed, uh, Akar, uh, I'm going to kind of launch right into uh, my sort of background and also then go on to talk about the work that I've done uh, in kind of the context of the uh, topic for discussion, right? And uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, the last time I did something like this, I was terrible because I kept on rambling and it took too long. Fawzan knows and I think, you know, I must have bored everyone. So this time I've actually written it down so that I can keep to the time. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, refer to this and so that I can be precise and concise. Okay. Sure. Uh, all right. So, uh, you know, uh, my name is Prashant. And uh, for everyone who's on, on this uh, uh, Zoom talk, and uh, I've been a photographer. I'm a photographer. And uh, basically, I've been a photojournalist and a documentary photographer. I also work as a curator and uh, do my own exhibitions and books, etc. But let me just start, as uh, uh, Akara suggested, with the background. So, you know, in college, uh, I've studied in Pune in Ferguson College. And uh, I was in, this is about, uh, started, uh, this is about the mid 70s. And uh, in college, I was drawn to left wing thought, got interested in the arts. And that is when I took up photography, borrowing my dad's camera. This was the time just after emergency, 1977. And there was a rejuvenated press, which was a long, good space for photojournalism. And that seemed to be the, uh, uh, the thing that attracted me, and that's where I wanted to go. Uh, so I dropped a year after my BA, spent tri time traveling around, taking some pictures, trying my hand at photography. 
and also got a chance to work on a research project on the Naxalite movement in Bihar, in Bhojpur. Um, but my ambition to become a photojournalist had to wait a little bit. Um, I went back to Pune for, to do my MA and simultaneously set myself up as a commercial and industrial photographer with a, with a bank loan. But I really, really sucked at that work. I was terrible at it and I was broke. So, you know, finally I chucked up everything. And in 1980, I moved to Delhi to look for a job as a, or work as a photojournalist. But you know, in, in that time, the uh, jobs in newspapers and magazines uh, were very limited. Freelance work paid like a pittance. And uh, I was an outsider, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the Delhi photojournalist community it was a close-knit community and it was it's kind of a, almost like family and I was nobody from outside. So it was very difficult to break in. And that is when uh, a, f a friend of mine uh, who, with whom I had worked on the uh, Naxalite project, Kalyan Mukherjee, and who had been senior to me in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in college and university in Pune, uh, who, and now was working as a journalist, he, had a, he wanted to work on a, on a book on uh, the Chambal band records, and he asked me to join, join which I joined him, and uh, I was quite happy to do it. And we were, we were uh, a third person joined. His name was Bridge Raj Singh. He was a recent history graduate, and he was also going to be the researcher and writer on this self funded book. And uh, so that's where I really first start my career from. Uh, Raghu, if you can start the, uh, the presentation, it'll be great now. So that's, you know, we spent three years on this project, on the Malkan project, on the, on the uh, dam bandits project. We lived cheap, lived in the villages, bombed around, and uh, in the process, we, and we were chasing the biggest decoy gang of that time, which was Malkan Singh. And we ended up getting involved in the surrender, and uh, that made us famous, of course. And uh, we spent a three, about three years on this project, which ended in a book. Next slide, please. Which became the story of Malkan Singh. And uh, it's been a, this book has been out of print for a long time, but it has great uh, uh, staying value. And it's been you know, used as reference all throughout, including recently uh, for a film called Son Chiria which you might have seen, you know, as, as a kind of a background reference of what bandits look like and what were the stories like. So that was uh, uh, that first project that I worked on and which sort of gave me a head start in, for, in, in journalism. And uh, suddenly I was better known and I didn't have to start right at the bottom in the world of journalism in Delhi. Yeah, so in... Uh, uh, in 1984, I started, you know, I kept on freelancing after this. And in 1984, I started working with Patriot newspaper. Patriot was a left-wing newspaper started by Aruna Safali, the well-known freedom fighter. Um, the editor was R.K. Mishra. And it was uh, closely aligned to uh, Indira Gandhi's uh, uh, Congress party. So they had a huge influx of money and they were the first magazine, newspaper to modernize in, in Delhi. I don't know if it, they were the first in India with uh, offset printing and photo typesetting. They had some great uh, journalists there. And uh, I started working with them. And uh, you know, there was a lot of space for, 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 for pictures. And I had a, a kind of a privileged position, I guess, because uh, I got a lot of freedom to do what I wanted to do and independence. So, and I was able to pursue really the stories that I was interested in, which is which I got interested in because of my left wing background, my interest in arts, working on uh, uh, on the uh, on the next uh, 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 research project on the next slide movement, and just the things that I was thinking about, which is our society, lives of ordinary people, and the burning issues of that time. And this is something that's remained right throughout in my work. So, uh, next slide. Raghu, 
can we have the next slide? Yeah. So, you know, I got, I got to cover uh, in that time, Punjab, the nine, uh, 1984 riots, you can go back. Okay, 1984 riots. That, that these are the pictures from the nine, uh, some of the pictures from the 1984 riots. Then uh, the next one, uh, the 1985, ne next 1985 communal riots in Ahmedabad, and many other important stories. But I also got a chance, uh, luckily, to spend a, a, almost a month in Cambodia. And I got to do my first exhibition and book, which was called The Survivors, Kampuchea, 1984. Uh, in 1986, I was asked to join India today, I guess because of the work that I'd been doing and uh, where I worked almost for 10 years. Again, I was lucky that I was able to continue working on stories of social and national importance. Uh, Kashmir, Punjab again, next slide. Stories about uh, women's issues. Uh, this was the time of the uh, Diorala in 1987-88 the Durala Sati and the are kind of a revival of the women's movement. So we did a lot of stories on that and how, uh, and the widows in Vrindavan was a big photo essay, which uh, became kind of a way of looking at the status of women in India. Um, next slide. I also got an opportunity to, to kickstart a long-term project, which I've been thinking about for a long time, on the contemporary situation of the Maharajas of India. Not the exotic image, but the kind of image which was inspired by Satyajit Ray's Chalsa Ghar, which I'd seen in my university days. And I was able to do that work. This, this work became the kind of uh, focus of, uh, of, or rather the base of a further work that I was able to do later on. And uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So this was the time when the right wing moved. So please go back. So this was about the time when you know the right wing Hindutva movement was gaining ground, or starting to kind of uh, capture the political space in India. So I was with uh, Advani at Somnath when he started his Rath Yatra that left, left a trail of communal incidents in its wake. And next slide. I was in Ayodhya on 6 December 1992 when they tore down the Babri Masjid. And India has never been the same. It's sort of, you know, the 1984 riots, communal riots, uh, the riots of the, all, all this has kind of sort of become, became out. I, know, I don't know about... Uh, I think almost all journalists and photographers in that period had to deal with communalism. We're still dealing with it, of course, as a, uh, but that became sort of an important uh, part of what I did right throughout uh, my work. Okay, so um, in, uh, in 1995, uh, I was invited to join Outlook, which was a new magazine a new news magazine uh, with a brilliant maverick editor, uh, Vinod Mehta, and uh, A-class editorial team, and the atmosphere and dynamics of a startup. So it was really interesting. And I was now part of the leadership of the, of the editorial team. I was an associate editor. And I would later on become the deputy editor of that magazine also, and uh, uh, which I guess was the first for, for, for a photographer in Indian journalism. Here also, I really got, uh, I was lucky. I guess I've been lucky throughout my career that I got to majorly do what the things that I was interested in. Of course, you know, as any photographer will tell you uh, who's worked in, in the media, you have to do a whole lot of other things also, but I'm sticking to the things that I was interested in in this presentation. So uh, next slide. Um, there were stories on infanticide, which were for the launch issue, which is uh, a die who actually uh, killed the unwanted baby, demonstrating how a baby was, is, was killed by them. Next slide. Uh, Drought-prone areas in Kalahandi and the 
travails of people there. Uh, next slide. Next story related to questions about who we are. Uh, I think uh, uh, Raghu, uh, just a little bit slower on the, you know, so that people can also. So uh, uh, story related to questions about who we are as we as India turned 15. Uh, next slide. Elections and also this whole question of who we are. Next slide. The Cargill War. And this is a well-known picture, but I mean, there's a long story behind the picture. I won't go into that. We can talk about it some other time. Um, next slide. And the Kumbh Mela and the advent of a new millennium, which for which we did a, a whole lot of special stories. At the end of 2001, I quit Outlook, Outlook to get back to being an independent photographer, which I am till now, you know. So, uh, next slide. In June, in, in 2002, I went back to Ayodhya to kind of understand what this place was all about and photographed it in black and white with film. And I've been kind of returning to this, I've been returning to Ayodhya uh, a number of times, you know, even as recently as the late last year and photographing it this place, which is the eye of the storm, which kind of transformed and has dominated the contemporary history of India. And I hope to be able to do a book with this work. Uh, next slide. Though I was not able to cover the Gujarat riots, uh, because I was, I was on the jury of the World Press Photos, I was out of the country, and I was working with uh, uh, sort of um, uh, consulting with Indian Express, so I could not go. But I did cover the aftermath, and this was an important story on which I call the wall, of how walls had been built within communities in, in Ahmedabad uh, to separate the Hindu and Muslim. So this was done, this picture was done in the, in the midst of the riots, in a lull period, just between the first round of rioting and the second round of rioting. And uh, next slide. And the Gujarat elections and the political rise of Narayan Modi. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, all this kind of uh, work of mine of in journal, photojournalism was put together as a book called King Common a Citizen. Next slide, please. Which, uh, which came out in 2007, which was edited by the brilliant uh, photographer and editor Sanjeev Seth. The book itself was a follow-up of my exhibition of 2000, which I got titled Kings and Commoners, which combined the work that I had kick-started in India today of the Maharajas of India and all the people that I had photographed and, and situation that photographed with ordinary people and, 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 and their lives. And this is, that's a, I'd call it Kings and Commoners. Uh, Sanjeev updated that work it was, and edited it to bring out this book. Uh, uh, I'm happy to announce that I'm actually working on another book now, which uh, is going to be published by Navjeevan and will come out uh, later this year, by the end of this year, hopefully, if things go well, and which is, in which I'm sort of writing the short text, backstories of some of the important pictures that, that I made and the stories and the stories I worked in. And uh, yeah, so that's something that I've I will come out at the end of the year. Uh, next slide, please. Since 2000, I've been photographing extensively using a panoramic camera. I'm just showing you some other work that I've been doing. And uh, it was a kind of unconsciously looking at the changing visual landscape of India. You know, since 2000, there's a lot of development in India, the opening up the, of the economy, globalization, and a lot of change and a lot of construction, you know? And this work became an exhibition. We can show some of the pictures now. Go ahead. Next, please. Next. 
and this became an exhibition called Pan India Shared Habitat, which was shown by the Sweer, which who you know is uh, the same organization that had uh, MAP for which we are doing this talk today. Um, around uh, and since about 2004, I'd sort of been moving slightly away from journalism and working in the development sector uh, with documentary photography, mainly with nonprofits working on issues of education, health, uh, livelihood, and uh, both in India, in Africa, um, parts of other parts of Asia also. And this has been a really rewarding kind of uh, work for me. You can so show the next, please. So this is like from uh, education for migrant children. Next, please. Um, on HIV. Next slide. And this also given me two books on migration and education for children, and even a, a book called, I mean, a picture for a book called Eight Sutra, which had many of the important Indian writers writing on uh, the story of HIV AIDS in India. Um, yeah, so the next slide, please. Since 2011, I've also been working and photographing in the square format on a series which I've called Indianisms, kind of, and, you know, collecting the kind of ironical, the idiosyncratic, uh, inventive images of India, India that I encounter as I move, travel around. This work is still continuing. I'm just showing you this as the end to show this is what I'm working on in the future. And with that, you know, uh, finished showing you what I wanted to show. And, and that my work is my work from about 1981 to now. And in a way, my contribution or to recording a certain aspect of the contemporary history of India. Now, how does that become a telescope into the idea of making visual narratives of, of a nation? I think we shall leave that to the discussion with Akar. Okay, so. Um, I started with my career with Midday and uh, I wanted to be a writer. I thought I'll make some quick millions like Akar and then retire early. But uh, that never happened. And I got sucked into photography and I've never looked back. I've been basically a Bombay boy and I've been seeing and shooting the city very extensively. And most of my subjects of my exhibitions and my two books in the third coming in is all Bombay based. And uh, I have only shot pictures that I have felt for it, you know. So my, my storyline is very something very close to me. And uh, if, if anybody is interested in seeing why I do certain stories, then you could check my terrace talk bit there. But now we're coming to the Bombay scene. So we'll start with the pictures quickly before taking much time. Okay, this is when I started my work in uh, midday. And uh, although this, these were never part of the assignments, but I always went out my out of my way to document the city, you know, whenever I could get time on a weekend or on a Sunday or early morning, if I had an afternoon shift, I would step out in the morning or if I had an evening shift, either way, whatever little time I had in hand, I would always wanted to shoot Bombay. Okay. And uh, those days it was very easy. The access was never an issue. People never had any issues. They would always welcome you. So this is my first impression of a mill, you know, always lived amongst the, uh, the mill surrounding because I stayed in central Bombay and there were a lot of mills around me. And I was naturally attracted to people around there and the, and the huge space that the mills had. So this was my very early work. I like as soon as I started handing a camera, I stepped into a mill with somebody whom I knew and I shot this picture of a Bombay mill, which is like, and in those days, since it wasn't a digital, we would only shoot four to five frames. In fact, in this case, I have only five frames of a mill. Next, please. 
okay bombay had lot of bada gadis you know and uh, those days now of course it's a fancy to i, I think now they have banned it in fact but earlier there were a lot of bada gadis doing the round of the city and this was the biggest landmass these people owned and they were the first to be targeted by mafia in the bombay you know because they had huge landmass and they drove them away and they and they knew the days were numbered because the government was getting tough on the goda gadis so this is one of the situation where the space is shared by the animal and the human being in that place so i also wanted to show like bombay is so much there's so much issues about space and the, the year they are sharing the space between the animal and the human being next okay this was at when sachin turned 18 he came down in his car to sign his first contract with mopatlal okay this was on his 18th birthday and he drove down i don't know whether he had a license because you get only license after the 18 years but he came in his own car mm-hmm. and he he got he signed his first contract with mopatlal next this was the first time bombay was going to see a sedan car okay Maruti 1000 was being launched in Taj, and they wrapped it up like a birthday gift, like a gift to the five lucky people who would be getting the keys on that day. So this was the first sudden. Which year is this, Pooja? Sorry. Sorry. Which year is this? This would be somewhere around 90s, you know, between 1991, if I'm not mistaken, the right, because this was still black and white, and I started shooting color after 93. So this must be around. between 88 89 90 with one of these three that i can check you know next next acha these two icons the two parsi gentlemen jrd and ani palkiwala i had never seen them in a traditional dress okay they were always suited booted when whenever you went to shoot them or whenever they came for a indian merchant chamber meeting or whatever so this was the first time i got to shoot them in the traditional parsi dress i thought it's a very iconic to have two people who are giants in their own field sharing the stage next then we had this harshad mehta period which made life difficult for all the photographers and reporters you know mm-hmm. kept running from pillar to post to get any image and every image that we could get of him so this is uh, one of the iconic pictures where he caught and being remanded to custody next okay bal thakre who doesn't know him but what i liked about was the two cousins trying to exchange some moments behind which now of course they are separated by they both have the different political parties and all that but this was one of the tender moments which i thought looks very interesting when bal thakre is addressing a media and these two young raj and udav sharing a small eye to eye contact next this uh, bombay started getting skyscrapers very early and uh, this was uh, one of the biggest tower which was coming up in central bombay and uh, i just out of curiosity i wanted to see in fact i wanted to go to the terrace and see how bombay would have looked at that height you know but of course i was denied permission so i went below the parking space and i shot this pictures form down while they while, while it was being constructed next okay the introduction of pepsi cola so they had set up huge uh, you know rubber uh, balloons in the shape of pepsi, pepsi colas all across bombay and you have tried to juxtapose with a local coconut seller just to uh, just to see what what's an offering for this guy you know now that pepsi is going to be in bombay next i like the 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 wording behind you know the new sign of success which kind of uh, tells about the the difference between the young and the old and it kind of works with this picture very well you know so this was again shot at race course and i just got a very interesting frame in terms of age difference between the two generation next 
this was when jeans was just getting into the scene you know every every teenager and every and jeans was the thing you know and i happened to go backstage one day and uh, i found everybody wearing jeans you know so i just got this shot where everyone was wearing jeans and i it was the the new the new fashion that was getting into bombay next of course with a tattered uh, this thing you know you tear it purposely to make it more happening this was the first, sorry this was the of course the bombay uh, bandra wali ceiling which was in the new which was long overdue and finally they were like trying to bridge the last uh, gap in between the bridge so we could travel faster from worli to bandra or and vice versa so this is an iconic uh, bridge now but this was during the construction time you know next one thing missing from bombay are the chawl you know which uh, which are just disappearing from the city scene so this is one of the holy images where in the background you see all this chawl unfortunately this chawl is no more it got demolished i think two years after this uh, picture was done you know people are enjoying holy on the street and the chawl that disappeared now next okay we still travel like this of course now during the lockdown so this is a despite um, new trains being introduced and the the duration of the train you know getting more and more you know from 3 minutes earlier we have come to 1 and 1/2 and 2 minutes but still the crowd is still the same you know we haven't changed in terms of the way we travel in the city next of course this is the the famous dharavi and uh, still tenders are being floated and still plans are being there to convert dharavi into a livable place as such but it still exists we we are not going to we are going to see this for some more time i guess so this is a small festival of the temple which is being celebrated in dharavi next okay this is the changing scene of bombay you know you have this old facade wall of hindustan mills which is now hosting very high end towers in the background you know and gradually all the mills have given way to the high rises you know so this is one of those dying mills with the dying infrastructure of the gate and all that next next okay the advance of sorry sorry go back go back please this is the advance of dish antenna you know people don't have homes sorry go ahead okay this is a sorry this is the underpass of a bridge in bombay which is actually a slum you know which is actually a illegal construction which has been the the, the underpass has been occupied from both sides and they all have a dish antenna in their home you know so this is the advent of dish antenna and entertainment in every homes in bombay next okay these two pictures the one picture on the left i had shot 16 years ago and then i went back to the same chawl to shoot this picture the only difference that i saw after 16 years is the staircase you know from the wooden staircase which has been taken off and now they uh, in put in a iron staircase rest even after 16 years the chawl remain the same so the development hasn't reached hasn't percolated to every section of society and these are all basically marathi manus which the political parties claim for and uh, but they they still live in the same situation even after 16 years next so again bombay had this uh, slum rehabilitation where builders take the icing on the cake and on the left you see the slums near mahalakshmi which is now coming up as a concrete structures for the slum rehabilitation and also the builder gets the chunk of the land you know fsi on the land so this is a two contrasting bombay that was again you know 10 12 years earlier shot and now recently shot next okay this flyovers are a saw business for a photographer you know it cuts into all the facade and it cuts into 
all the pictures. So now on the left, you have this iconic Minara Masjid. On the right, sorry, I think there's something wrong here. So on the right, you have the iconic without the flyover. And now you have a JJ flyover, which is cutting into the facade of the, uh, of the Minara Masjid. You know? So this is the irony of, uh, of solving Bombay's transport problems. You know? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, so I think we're really fortunate to have uh, the work of two uh, people that has spanned, I think, the yeah. decades that have brought India into uh, what would be considered to be true uh, modernity, uh, a completely uh, open economy in many ways, uh, different from the one that was there in the 70s when uh, Pandya started his work. I wanted, uh, before going back to uh, Prashant Panjaya, to ask uh, Fazan. Fazan, we saw that there was a transition from black and white to color. Was that basically because the uh, periodical that you were working for only had black and white pages first and then it moved to color? Or uh, was yeah. that... Was so what, what happened is black and... Uh, Midday was primarily a black and white with a color supplement on Sundays. Okay? But very limited uh, pages, you know, like maybe four pages in the entire section, you know. So... I got introduced to color only when I joined India today. Okay. So my change in shooting from black and white to color happened because of the requirement of the publication. And uh, tell me something, is there uh, a difference that you have found in the longevity? Does a photograph age better if it is shot in black and white? So it's a personal feeling, basically, that a uh, lot of people feel black and white takes away the, 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 it kind of mutes, you know, it kind of mutes all the element and comes to, mm. and brings it to the same level, you know, and sometimes the colors are very loud. So a lot of people prefer to shoot black and white, but I still love to shoot in color and mm. uh, I, I don't shoot black and white if it's not required. One thing that really strikes me is the fact that all of the work that we have seen by both of you has uh, has longer legs. It has uh, longevity, and I think new stories that have been that would that might have been written on the same subjects at the same time would not have the kind of life that these photos do. Uh, Prashant, may I ask you two things? One is how do you access the life of a dacoit? What was the period of time that you spent uh, with that with that gang and with that uh, individual? How did you get access to him? And also speak to us about the nature of documentary photography. What is it that you're trying to capture, which is different from a news photographer? And what is it that makes it live longer? Well, uh, the first part for uh, Malkhan Singh, uh, we worked on that project for three years. So the first, uh, it took us almost nine to 10 months to actually make contact, chasing him to make contact with him. And uh, the access, and we were in, living in the areas that were his sanctuary and uh, well aware of where he was, but I mean, he refused to meet us. So the access came only at the time when he was himself cont contemplating a surrender and felt that these three journalists hanging around this area might be a good and safe via media. So it was a quid pro quo. It was not. Uh, some great uh, feat of ours. It was a quid pro quo. We got, got time to spend with the gang in the last few days before the surrender. And uh, I guess I was also, by spending time with the gang, I was also the sort of um, guarantee for the safety that they won't get bumped out. So this so, happened uh, immediately uh, before the period that they um, handed themselves over yeah. to uh, the police, okay. Yeah. And uh, were so you there was, when they did actually hand themselves over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and continued work on, you know, and continued work on the on the on the story and his his, uh, you know, because when we started, we wanted to do a pretty different kind of book, and then when we uh, got involved in the surrender, I got to know his story that we changed and became the story of Malkhan Singh as a book. So we, after the surrender, we started work in 1981. 1982 was the surrender, and we finished work on the book in, in finally in end of 1983, and the book was published in 1985. So it's a long period of time. So that's. And uh, speak to the second part of what I asked. What okay. is it in the nature of documentary photography that you aim to shoot for? Well, you know, the, uh, 
uh, I think, I guess documentary photography and, and photojournalism is more or less the same thing for me, you know. It's just that, you know, the documentary photography and uh, just like long form journalism is a slower form of, of, of photographing. And the, the basis, and the basis, I guess, of both photojournalism, press photography, and documentary photography is that you're photographing things as they are. You're not making up things. So it's just the kind of time that you spend on something uh, that becomes the, you know, this distinguishing feature as compared to press, press photography where you have to go and record an event and come back quickly, upload the pictures or send off the pictures. Whereas here you get to spend time on it. That's all. I have one question, one more question question for you and then one more question for the both of you. For you, uh, Prashant Panjia, you, you documented things that were uh, traumatic then and as you say, they remain, they, they remain a, 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 a trauma for us even now. What is it that goes through a photographer when he's looking through this kind of event through the lens? Uh, can you give us a few anecdotes about your time spent on the road with uh, Mr. Advani and when the mosque was pulled down? Yeah, well, you know, uh... Uh, the uh, the demolition of the Babri Masjid, uh, I was assigned by India Today to follow Advani along with a reporter. And there were other photographer reporter teams that were following Vajpayee and Murli Manohar Joshi as they converse. Uh, they were doing Rath Yatras to converge in, in Lucknow on 5th December. And then they were all going to go to Ayodhya for the Kar Seva on the 6th of December. So... I was assigned by India Today. Uh, the reporter was Yuvraj Gimre, and we we were following Advani, so we were with him all this time, and that's how I landed up in Ayodhya with him, uh, following him. Of course, there are lots of in between stories which are too long to tell, but and I was in the on top of the Ram Katha Kunj with all these leaders, which was the stage, so it was a slightly distant view of of the uh, of the Babu Masjid. Uh, the, at the Chabutra, in front of the Babri Masjid, where, was, where all the photographers were gathered, because that's where the Kar Seva would take place. Uh, I could not see the Chabutra. Uh, and as you know, all the uh, lensmen, the photographers, video pe people were all bashed up. The camera was snatched. Were you so was not... No, I was not. I was under Rab Katha Kunj with... So I was the only photographer who didn't get beaten up. And the only photographer, because I was with Advani, that they thought I was some VHP photographer. And I kept on photographing the fall of the domes. So the, that sequence of the fall of the domes of the Babri Masjid, I was the only person who got those pictures because the rest of the people were prevented from, you know, in such a situation, I, you know, whatever I was feeling, I had to put, just keep my head down and continue. What were watching. you feeling? It, it was a certain amount of disgust with seeing your kind of, mob violence and the kind of mob rule that was going on, you know, and the kind of uh, pettiness with which uh, the way that we, some people were, be, most people were behaving, including some guys who were part of our tribe, you know, mm. and who yes. later on became spokespersons and all that comes the BJP. But, you know, uh, the thing is, uh, the question that you ask me is traumatic, you know. In, in the earlier times, we photographers had to watch out for the cops, you know? Mm. I'm sure Fauzan will tell you the same. The cops would beat you up when they were covering a demonstration and snatch, break your camera, snatch your film, whatever it is. 1984 was the first time when photographers started getting beaten and attacked by the mobs. And it's doing like that all the time right now. Any communal riot, any riot, you know, the photographers are always the target of both the police and the mob. So, photographing these situations, and especially with communal rats, in the earlier one was self sort of focused on, 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 on making the pictures. But today, uh, to tell you the truth, I get very angry. You know, in the later part of my life as a photographer, I just tend to get very angry and feel bad about what's going on. If I had my way, I'd probably bash some of the rioters also. You would participate in the story. Uh, Fazan Hussain, may I ask you uh, what you think the role of uh, uh, still photography is today in the year uh, 2020? You have worked through a period when we didn't have 
a television uh, as much as we do uh, today. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have uh, hundreds of millions of people with their own uh, cameras. What is the role of uh, still photography uh, in the news uh, in this time? Okay, I'll talk for myself. I yeah. feel I we need to document the time we live in. Okay, and that's one thing which I firmly believe. Okay. we have to document the time we live in okay having said that what i am trying to do is all as many years away i'm going to shoot pictures i might be leaving behind a good collection for archival material and even today when i go and shoot covid 19 despite advancing age my my family get really worried about this you know and but i said you know okay somebody has to do a very serious work on this and i did do some nice i wouldn't say nice but i did do some real serious documentation of this covid thing you know so my 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 only thing is that i'm going to document the time that i'm going to i'm going to live this planet and can you speak to us uh, uh, fazan hussain about what it is that you would tell somebody who's coming into the uh, profession of uh, photography now uh, what is it that they should be looking out for to do the same thing that you said you are trying to do? which is document your uh, time okay so i the way i started looking at photography is documenting things around me you know my first exhibition was bombay because i am i have been born brought up and now decaying in bombay okay then i moved to uh, like i'm just giving you a few example that when i moved to staying in suburbs after marriage my next show was on railways the way people travel you know lifeline bombay's lifeline tracks that was my exhibition then when i was becoming a father i happened to visit kamadipura for an assignment and i saw the children around there okay so i started shooting children of kamadipura when i got married in a mass marriage i i looked at mass marriages all over the world uh, or sorry all over india and i started shooting mass marriages in india so whatever has come to me you know when i turned 40 people say started saying you know why don't you perform hajj now it's time for you to turn religious enough is enough so then i started questioning the concept of faith and i did a show on faith you know so whatever has come to me has been related to in pictures you know so if anybody who who's aspiring to be a photographer just document what comes to you you know don't wait for subjects to fall just try and see what is li- what is life treating you as i'll give you one example one student of mine was not coming to classes you know and i called for him and i asked him why why aren't you coming for the classes he said my grandfather is not well i said what happened he he said he's terminally terminally ill and i have to take care of him so i said why don't you start shooting him you know so he said should i i said of course you have a great access to somebody who's there with you 24 hours so just Indeed. try and document him so i am saying just try and shoot something which is appealing to you you know don't wait for assignment and don't wait for big uh, magazines and newspapers giving you assignment just work Shoot around you yeah that's very yeah. sage uh, advice yeah. Yeah, very, uh, very Raja, can you advice. take the same question which is what is the role of still photography in uh, 2020 uh, particularly what is the role of it in our country in the times that we live in oh boy that's a big question but you know i think uh, what fazan said was very very important and uh, that's something you know uh, we underestimate the value of ordinary things and ordinary people and the lives and i think uh, it's it's that i will take it from there what pozaram said to answer your question that you know uh, it's not the big things you know for me also though i showed you pictures from all kinds of things but there were assignments that came to me you know and i worked on things which are very very ordinary or uh, to begin with and i think that is the important thing to remember that uh, it's not the big things or not the big assignments or the big uh, stories that actually make up uh, the collective kind of whatever you want to call it history of or importance of of what is important in journalism and uh, uh, i think that's something that was is uh, in in this particular time when uh photojournalism itself is is facing a lot of challenges because of of whole lot of reason digital the availability of so much imagery 
I mean, the questions, not enough work, you know, uh, for, for photojournalists. I think these are things to remember that, you know, why you're there to begin with, you know, where a lot of us keep on blaming uh, the institutions that we work in, that we don't get the opportunity, we don't get this, and we don't have. And uh, that's true, you know, the, it's very tough for photojournalists and press photographers now. But we have to remember why we first of all opted to be photojournalists. It was a reason, it was a passion. And you have to keep on fulfilling that. And if you keep on fulfilling that, that work will amount to something. It will amount to something in the overall picture of the history and, you know, record of what our lives are all about, you know. So that's Absolutely. the can I, add, I'm here. Can I add here? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, I, I, I really like what Prashant said, the word passion. You know, that's the only thing that will keep you going. Passion. Do you, do the two of you, uh, I'll just give it over to Raghu after this uh, for the, uh, uh, the questions from the others. Do the two of you, you see yourselves as uh, artists? As journalists, as uh, as what? What? How would you describe yourself beyond being a photographer? I would say I'm an unemployed photographer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a daily wage, I'm a daily wage laborer. You're a daily wage laborer. Fantastic. <laughs> Raku, can we have uh, questions from the audience? I'll just uh, ask yeah. the two of them to tell us where it is that we can source. Uh, material from them should be want to find it. Uh, is there a website that the two of you have? Yeah, I have a website. And could you just spell it out, please? It's prashantpanjiar.com. That's P A N J I A R.com. Prashant, Prashant for you? Prashant uh, Panjir. It's lensimpressions.com. Lens impressions, impressions one impressions. word dot com. Yeah, I've we heard. posted it on the chat box. Okay. Um, Okay, so a um, couple of questions. I think I'll start with uh, 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 Prashant. This is for you from Homia Tavadia. Uh, I think both of you, uh, uh, do you still follow Ayodhya in the present times? That's the question for you. Yeah, of course. I mean, I started the work in 2002. I've been going back. I said it's something that I've done over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, I still haven't completed the book that I'm working on. And uh, the situation has changed now with the Supreme Court verdict of what Ayodhya might become. So I have to pause and wait uh, to go back more and see it in its new light. You know, for all you know, Ayodhya is going to have a 60 foot Ram statue and will have shopping malls and it'll become this glitzy place from this decrepit old town and become, a, who knows, you know? So if I have to continue the work, I'll have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this question is for um, Fazan. Um, I really like the paradoxes you showed. Tender coconut seller sitting in front of a huge Pepsi Cola installation, uh, and the dish antennas under the bridge. Have you ever thought of curating a series uh, this paradoxes as a, with paradoxes as a theme? Uh, curating for myself or for somebody else? Yeah, as in curating your work uh, with the theme of paradoxes, you know. That's yeah, I have, I have done that. I have done that. I have shown that. I have done that. I have done that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I ask the both of you, uh, starting with you, Fazan, what is it that you are working on at this moment? Uh, I'm working on Kalipili Taxi, you know, the, the premier Padmini Taxi, which has and? gone off the road now. And uh, hopefully I was supposed to release it this year. But as things stand, I don't think I'll be able to because my my printing cost has to come out from corporate sales. Okay, that's what I'm right. looking at. I may not be looking at making a profit, but my corporate, the my printing cost has to come out from corporate sales, and that is a very big question mark now. Yeah. And could you just tell us what it is that it costs to print a photograph of a particular size for display? A uh, one book. Yeah the, One yeah, the two earlier books which I did are of the same size with the same number of pages. So they were 10, 12 by 12 and 300 pages. And one book to me would cost 1600 rupees at home. Okay. He's talking about uh, the book. Panjab, what is it that you are working on now? You know, uh, like I said, I was, uh, I'm uh, finishing, I mean, uh, working on a book 
of telling the back stories of some of the pictures uh, that I've worked on and the stories, uh, which will be published by Navjeevan at the end of this year, hopefully. Uh, uh, my Ayodhya project is on hold and I'll continue working on that. And I've been working on a series of pictures called Indianisms, which I should, as a, one of the pic images I showed as the last image in this, in my presentation. I have so many, I have so many questions. Arago, do you have any more or should I just go ahead? Um, I go think ahead. you should go ahead, uh, Akash. Uh, tell me something, uh, both of you, starting with you, uh, Prashant Panji, uh, uh, how important is uh, equipment and do you spend a lot of time servicing it yourself? Has it changed over the years? Uh, equipment is important and uh, technology is cha changes a lot. So, um, uh, but equipment is not the be all and end all. I mean, like, uh, I think uh, uh, any good photographer will tell you that. Uh, uh, it's good to be up to date with technology and to servicing is not something that I can do myself. You know, it, yeah, it has to go to a professional, but I do change uh, my equipment when it's required. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, and I've actually managed to put some of the technology, like for example, a digital autofocus, now the mirrorless camera to good use in my work, you know, but I still, I still shoot film. I still shoot film. I still shoot film. While my well, partner, I'm... sorry, you said something. I want you yeah. to answer the same question, please. Do you do you service your own equipment? Have you moved on from film? Yeah, yeah. I have left film long back. I haven't shot film for a very long time, and I see no reason why I should be doing it because digital is far easier for me. Not that I'm very equipped with all the uh, gizmos and all that, but I just basically need two things. You know, one is I'm addicted to autofocus because I can't do manual focusing now because my reflections are very slow now with the age. So I need an autofocus and I, I need a fixed lens. That's it. I'm not very gungo about uh, new models and all that. I still shoot pictures with my 30 or 25 year old camera. You know, I'm very comfortable. For that, I'm saying I. Professor Pajar, both of you, I, I want you to tell us what it is that constitutes the a photographer's eye. And did it change for you over the years from your 20s to now? The, the, the idea of a composition and the way you see a scene, has it changed? Okay. Uh, see, the biggest fun in teaching, you know, I teach at three places in Bombay and Pune. And I feel the biggest kick I get out of teaching is when the students come back with the assignments, they come out with a very complete new way of looking at things, you know, which our puddy daddy heads cannot comprehend, you know. But the way they look at things, that makes you realize, okay, oh, this can also be looked at this way, you know, and you get really charged, you know. So, in fact, rather than me teaching, I always learn from them because they are young, they are energetic, they look at, they don't look at the prism of, uh, <laughs> The, the parameters which have been fixed by the you know senior photographers, they just go and try themselves and they come back and I'm very charged and I'm very thrilled to see their work, you know. So I have a couple of more questions from the audience. I want uh, Prashant Panjia to answer the same uh, question. What is it that constitutes the photographer's eye and for you has it changed over the years? Yeah, okay. So, you know, I mean, of course, speaking in the context of photojournalism and, and documentary photography, I think, you know, the idea of the photographer's eye, for me also has changed, definitely. But the idea of the, the photographer's eye has also changed in the way photography was, in journalism was done before and has been changing over the time. I think with the uh, availability of information in the digital age and the availability of information about it, it's not so important anymore of what you're photographing but how you're photographing it. And I think that is a, ma a major change in the way that uh, photographic expression has changed in the, from the earlier time. You know, if I look at my own work and I see that there is, a, uh, in the, with my earlier work, is steeped in the time of that, that time of photojournalism, you know, of, uh, of kind of a looking at immediate uh, physical events, etc. And that has been changing over the period of time because, I mean, you don't need to know, for example, that a riot took place, but you need to know yeah. 
how people are feeling there, you know. And I think that's the what constitutes actually the photographer's eye. You know, it's not an eye as the in a in a physical sense, but more in terms of an expression of how I, I would say, only describe it as how you photograph something. Lovely, Arago. Yeah, uh, this is a question to the both of you from Prachi Gupta. When you have documented communities of people by spending a long time with them, have you ever felt exploitative and how have you given back to those who have brought your stories to life? Farzan, you're going first. Okay. See, I, if I, I can give you an example of uh, me doing a story on children of Kamadipura. Uh, mm -hmm. And I spent almost a little over two years doing that, uh, doing that pictures. And uh, initially for six months, I didn't pick up a camera, I just went there to be seen, you know, and, um, and to be accepted by people around there. I would always go with some gift to the children, you know, now just to make, the, make, make it very friendly, you know, that my presence should not be very obstructive to their way of thinking and way of moving around, you know. And uh, I was almost thought about as an NGO working in that area. So I was shooting very innocently the children who, in normal circumstances, the children are supposed to be coming back in the dark. You know, once it sets dark, you're, you are generally call your children in the home. But in this case, they were told to go and move out in the dark. You understand when, when the parent, when the mother starts working in the night, they are supposed to be going out. So, so this is a, a very ironical thing which I wanted to shoot and which I did shoot. And uh, I don't think I ever exploited them. In fact, I raised the awareness of the situation of them being on the street in the night, you know, in a, in a very small way. And uh, I, I never felt that I'm exploiting the situation. In fact, the, 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 the uh, NGO working in that area, Prerna, asked me not to shoot some of the children's faces, you know. And which I, which I respectfully did not, you know. So I, there's never an intention of exploiting a situation out for an, for a, especially for a photo assignment. Sure. Can, can yeah. uh, Prashant Pranjaya take the same question, please? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a very important question because it's uh, something that uh, plagues all of us uh, photographers uh, all the time. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good question to ask and it's a good question for all of us to ask ourselves whenever we go into a community or photographing a community or a situation, are we being responsible or are we not? I think Fauzan told us about his method and how he makes it himself responsible, etc. But I think it's a good question to ask because we uh, photographers, journalists, all of us tend to, can be very exploitative of such situations. And, you know, we have to really learn to be responsible, like I said, and for that, I, I have a simple uh, thumb rule that I go by, you know, is that, you know, when you're making pictures or working on a story, and you have to know that there are always more, that there are three stakeholders in this whole game. One is the person or the community or the situation that you're photographing. Are you being true and responsible towards them? Two is your, you yourself and or the institution that you represent, the newspaper, magazine, NGO, whatever you want to call it, you know, and yourself, of course. And third uh, is the viewer. You have a responsibility to them also. And I think if you are aware of this, then you should be able to answer the question. I, don't, I do not know if uh, just doing something for that community is enough. I think responsibility or taking responsibility is the more important part of it. Thank you. Raghu? Yeah. Uh, next question is from Ravi Kumar Kashi. Uh, this is for the both of you. In the current situation, could you talk about the danger of photographs narrating a single story? Uh, no, I, I didn't understand what does it mean. Uh, do, you, do you feel that photographs might sometimes represent only one side of a story and not both sides, assuming there are two sides to a story? Yeah, that's very true. It, 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 it is happen happening as of now. And uh, like, like why India? You know, you know, internationally you have this embedded journalism 
which only represents one side of the story so it's it's there everywhere you know and uh, now with this uh, present political situation people have taken that to another level you know and uh, let me just ask you this uh, and maybe the both of you can ask this it's linked to this do you think a photographer's role is more reporter or it's more commentary or both prashant well you know um, i think this these are uh, i mean this is leading up to you know uh, the really the topic of what uh, you wanted to discuss which is the uh, kind of creating a uh, visual narrative of who we are etc but i think uh, to answer that question you know uh, i really feel that at this time and uh, earlier earlier a, for, a journalist or photographer was meant to be unbiased reporting what and the photograph was supposed to represent the truth we mm-hmm. all know we all know that that is not so the photograph has never been always truthful and if it's not been not told lies it has at least uh, reveled in being uh, in the untruth you know mm. uh but i think the way that people the reporters started reporting the stories bringing opinion feeling into what they're writing uh i think photographers also have the right to express their own feelings about the situation so i do not think that just recording an event is enough we we as people who are communicators and photographers have to be able to give the viewer some sense of what people are feeling also and that may come through uh, our giving our own opinion or putting in our opinion of what, how we feel about that situation i think no picture is without opinion sure for for graph it i would hope add, add here ke yeah please please uh go ahead it all depends where you working and for whom are you working you know there there's a very very clear divide you know it can't be like if i'm doing a personal story for myself i can still be a balanced guy you know but uh, if i'm doing for an organization or a newspaper or a magazine which wants me to frame my shots in a certain way yes. i have to cater to it very simple right no, but i i think we have a choice there, at least as as photographers i mean especially in journalism i mean in, uh, because uh, we should be able to argue our cases and we have all done it you know fauzan you've done it i've done it in 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 uh, in the newsroom saying no this picture is not right this pic- we would prefer to use this picture because for, for whatever reasons that we felt and but i think on those days are gone no but <laughs> i the thought the thought okay. or the re- may i ask may i ask uh, may i ask the both of you to very quickly uh, tell us uh, if there were many instances of you or the or the uh, photography desk picking pictures that would either not be used by the news desk or would be cropped wrongly and so on uh, and, and 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 to add to that who were who were the editors who did a really good job of uh, making sure that 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 this did not happen prashant panje you first <laughs> <laughs> well you know uh, uh, i'm sorry to say and i'm sure all the for ph- photographer will say that most of the words people were visual in in journalism were always visually illiterate you know <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry to say it but it it was true and it was always a fight but you know and and there were plenty of instances where pictures were used strongly were cropped badly but i think we all learned to fight for our uh, and I, i i was in a very happy situation i guess you know because when i went joined outlook i was one of the associate editors so i could put my foot down and say no this can't happen this way you know and uh, even in india today i, I worked uh, when and uh, fauzan was there also uh, when i was joined uh, raghu rai was the picture editor and uh, nobody would cross him you know but he left he left in two years later and we did face trouble but i think uh, that battle is an unending battle it'll carry on and if the question being asked by uh, a new photographer or a younger photographer now it's a b- battle that you have to keep on fighting it doesn't change okay 
Uh, we, I'm going to combine two questions from Gautam and Dipak. Okay, can you just ask for them to answer that please first? Yeah. Sorry. See, now I don't want to make any more enemies. <laughs> Let's leave it. No, you don't need to name anybody. Just uh, tell us what, what, what the experiences have been of a photographer and how it yeah. is that. Prashant, Prashant had a chance to fight, you know, because he was in Delhi. Okay. Yeah. I was like, right. a, I was like in Bombay. Who would, nobody would care to even listen to what I would want to say, you know. So, I just accepted life. I, I accepted as a karma, you know. So life goes on. <laughs> okay. But I, I get, I, I'll tell you one thing, Akar, which I which I want to share. Yes. Here. Uh, okay. All the frustrations that came out in that incident made me go and shoot out for myself. You know, I okay. would I would pick up a magazine. I would say, shit, wrong picture, wrong cropping, and I would say, fuck it. I will go and do something for myself now. And sure. that, that gave me really impetus to step out and do pictures for myself. And in the long run, I think it helped me, you know, yeah. otherwise I would have been very complacent, you know, I said, no, this sure. is not happening, you know, so for me, it worked fantastically. Very nice. Rago? Yeah, um, I think you've touched upon this, uh, but I'm going to ask the questions from Gautam and Dipankar. Nonetheless, uh, do you think today's press photo journals capture things as they are, cases in point, Trump spouting snaps from knee level pointing up to the sky as the background. Modi snaps with his index finger pointing up. Uh, and also your thoughts on fake photography, which muddies the credibility and the message. So these two are linked. And lastly, this is a question from my colleague Lekha, uh, your relationship to Photoshop. Well, you know, that uh, I think um, it's a very, very valid question because, you know, if uh, again, uh, what was the last line of the topic, Akar, of the topic of our conversation? It was, uh, the, it was, the, uh, was it the question that was asked or the last line no, of what we, we have discussed? We are discussing, creating a visual. The truth uh, of our times. Yeah. The truth of our time, but the last line. Of that role point. in shaping of the yes. historical narrative. Role of, in shaping of the historical narrative. I think that's where, you know, Im imagery and photography has always had a very dynamic, and very important role in in projecting uh, historical narrative of a nation or people. I mean, uh, if uh, you were to look at uh, the example given of Narendra Modi with a uh, hand in the sky, and that's a narrative that's created from from the, a political re leadership or a regime or a political or, or say anybody, uh, they can create imagery that will make them look good and create another truth of what we are. And uh, uh, this is where photography is always misused uh, by the powers to be, by, by the powers to be, by organizations. Uh, we always know the use of photography in propaganda, you know, and uh, I think that's something that we should be aware of uh, and be uh, critical of. But uh, and for some sense, you speak to the uh, point about uh, Photoshop and the I will, yeah, I will touch upon fake and Photoshop, you know, which has a very thin dividing line as such, you know. So Photoshop, I don't personally do it because I don't. Uh, can you tell those it. of us who might not know what the Photoshop is, please? Photoshop is basically a makeup on a face, you know, I would put it in a simple term, like you put a makeup on a girl, same way you do Photoshop on a picture, you know, but I haven't learned the trick. So whenever the need arises, I outsource my work on Photoshop. And the reason not learning Photoshop is because I don't, once I do that, I think I will be spending more time on the monitor rather than, than being on the streets, you know, so I have mm. consciously kept myself away from Photoshop. And there's very little need for Photoshop in my pictures as such, you know. And about fake photography, yeah, to each his own, you know. I can't really say anything on this because there have been legends, legendary photographers whose work have now been proved that they are fake, you know. And yes, indeed. Yeah. Shatters, it shatters your whole whole belief in uh, somebody whom you were looking for, looking all your life as pictures. And then one finally you realize, oh my God, this is what it is it kind of shakes shake you up, you know. So I, I finally would like to say to each is only, you know, you, you really can't be holding a banner and saying what is good and what is bad. Okay. You know, well, on the well, photo, Photoshop thing, I just want to say that, go ahead, you know, go ahead. that uh, as far as the rules of photojournalism are concerned, they are 
pretty clear that you know uh, the use of photoshop in the way that the darkroom was used in the earlier time to make your prints uh, is valid and there are limits i mean most organizations even uh, uh, wire photo agencies or the world press photo have very strict guidelines on what you can do which you cannot alter the reality or the, or the picture or alter the editorial content of the picture and that's the bottom line within that photoshop is basically uh, the same thing as what we did in the darkroom you do on the computer now i mean in in photojournalism in other for, forms of photography the world is open yeah. for the, whatever the world yeah um, we have a question from akriti saha uh, looking at the camera as a witness of our times especially this covid 19 period how do you think vernacular photography will play a role in our documentation history of this period um maybe you could comment on this in the uh, in the context of social media and uh, yeah so that's the question from akriti uh, what does vernacular photography mean i am uh, not yeah, sure i know i trying to figure out what does vernacular yeah. mean <laughs> well <laughs> i i i don't know as well so i thought that well, it I, I, I i i i know it's not technical but i think it's it's a way of saying that you know uh, uh, the photography from from within the community and and within uh, the, you know so especially okay. in the in the context of social media everyone's a photographer everyone's taking pictures yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah yeah i, th I think uh, that sort of uh, related to the last question and then i'll hand it over to closing comments if uh, uh, any uh, with um, the proliferation of smartphones drones particularly you know what how has it changed uh, protest imagery and how has it been a witness so i think the first question was to do with corona with the uh, present situation with yes, covid yeah yeah okay. fazan you want to go first ah uh, see uh serious work will always count as i see you know and a lot of people have done and i've i've been seeing a lot of work on covid you know so vernacular or no vernacular but you know i i simply want to understand that question i would say are you talking about a serious work that is going to hold value in 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 the in the years to come i would say yes it would okay and um, that's it yeah if you can elaborate better on the question because i am i'm still not understanding this question very well you know no um i can i yeah, yeah yes. try and try and answer the question well you know i think uh, we have to accept the fact that you know we are as professional photographers and for journalists are doing work and there is a whole world out there that is also making pictures and collectively maybe we we will be able to tell a story i think it's important it's important to allow for that to happen i think a lot of the pictures of of uh, well, i'd be interested in looking at pictures uh, for example of this whole unfortunate and completely unnecessary event that took place of this mass migration of of yeah, yeah. labor going back which was unavoidable completely but you know we as photographers go out and and make those pictures also but i'd be very very happy to and intrigued to look at the pictures because all these this is a different kind of generation of labor they all have phones i would be very interested in looking at what pictures they are making of themselves while walking oh. on these roads you know i think that 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 would be a phenomenal look at uh, at our present history also so I, i would i would i would welcome it i would welcome it i think it's 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 a que question of amalgamating all these experiences you know together so i think it's a nice uh, way to to uh, phrase it actually a uh, vernacular photography uh, we were asked that uh, quite nice rako is there anything else and yeah. and, and i just want to add i want to add one more thing yes, please. about uh, <clears throat> mobile you know mobile photography i think um, it's come to stay now you know mobile photography is the medium which is the, the which is going to go big in a very big way you know and uh, the day is not far where the mobile company are going to only invest in making different kind of lenses you know to be put on the mobile and that's the final nail in the coffin of camera maker you know right now we don't have that uh, system of having different range of lenses i think that yeah. they they able to crack that cameras are gone i guess 
I don't even know if people buy those large cameras anymore. Raghu, do we have anything else? No, we don't. Uh, closing comments oh. and... and... I'll, uh, yeah, from, from, from uh, the two of them? Yeah, and from you and, you know, the two of them, yeah. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Fazan and uh, Prashant, do you have anything else to add to what it is that you said? Well, not really, uh, excepting, okay. to, you know, excepting to say that, you know... Uh, no, I think that was just a polite way of saying that please don't say uh, anything more. Yes. <laughs> so the websites are lensimpressions.com if I have it right for the yes. uh, for some yes. and, yeah. and it is uh, Prashant Panjia.com P-A-N-J-I-A-R.com uh, full name one word for for uh, um, his work. Thank you to the both of you for your time. It's been fascinating. Uh, thank you to uh, BIC as always. Thank you most of all to the people who tuned in. I hope this was useful for you. Please stay safe. Uh, back to you, Raghu. Thank you so much, uh, Prashant, Fazwan, Akar. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you for such a Thank lovely you. discussion.